St. Paul's Episcopal Church has long been considered a premier example of Georgian church architecture in the colonial southeast. Pioneering architectural historian, uh, uh, excuse me, Thomas T. Waterman went as far as to state that St. Paul's was an ideal in rural church design. Its architecture has often been identified with colonial Virginia traditions of Anglican church building. Yet closer examination demonstrates that St. Paul's plan has far more continuity with the architectural traditions of colonial Maryland. Most conspicuously, it follows an auditory church design, a form which char char characterized Maryland Anglican churches throughout the 18th century. Yet why would a church in a coastal town in colonial North Carolina so closely emulate a church plan which found its greatest representation among the Anglican architecture of Maryland? The answer can be found through examining the relationship between colonial adaptations of metropolitan church designs from Georgian London, the particular circumstances of Anglican establishment in colonial Maryland and North Carolina, and the cultural and social ideals of their respective parish communities. Through analyzing these relationships, one can begin to exegete the theologies of sacred space, as well as the social and cultural mores of colonial Edenton's Anglican elite as represented in the architecture of St. Paul's. St. Paul's Episcopal Church represents the second oldest church edifice in North Carolina, and one of the oldest to be in continual use since its founding. Begun on May 10th, 1736, St. Paul's will not be completed for almost another 40 years. Funding issues, the death of building committee members, and disagreements over design and construction kept the church from expedient completion. The church was finally ready for use on April 10th, 1760. However, it would take another 14 years before the interior woodwork and furnishings were finished. St. Paul's is a brick ecclesiastical building laid almost entirely in Flemish bond, save for the semicircular apse on its east wall, which is laid exclusively in header bond. The nave is gable roofed and is five bays long, three wide, and two stories tall. The, the north and south elevations possess centrally placed entrances framed by rusticated brick coins capped by three part keystones. The remaining bays are occupied by large 16 over 16 sash windows and topped with segmental arches. The west gable of the church is predominantly occupied by a margarine gauge square tower. The tower is composed of three stages, with the third rising higher than the principal block and is marked by wide belt courses. The church's east gable is without windows and has a semicircular apse projecting from it that is topped by a semi-conical roof. The apse has a single centered segmental arched chancel window bordered with gouged brick. The church's dimensions measure 60 feet long and 40 feet wide, thus giving it the shape of a rectangular box with a 1 to 1.5 ratio of width to length. The interior of St. James has experienced considerable modification and renovation since its completion in the late 18th century. From 1806 to 1809, North Carolina architect William Nichols undertook considerable renovations to the interior, bringing its furnishings into line with federal design patterns. Nichols also constructed the spire over the square tower. Another major renovation occurred in 1949 when a fire engulfed the church, destroying the roof, galleries, and spire. The church walls survived the blaze, and many of the internal furnishings had been safely stored before the conflagration. The building has, had also been subject to meticulous surveying before the fire, thus allowing the congregation to reconstruct the church according to its early 19th century appearance. While exacting detail was used in reconstructing the inside of the church, this rebuilding can still be considered a mid 20th century interpretation of an early 19th century interior. Fortunately, enough material exists to provide an approximate understanding of the appearance of St. Paul's original 18th century internal arrangement. Square brick tiles paved the church's floor. Columns supported a cove or barrel vaulted ceiling and provided support to the appending side and back galleries. And the pews were positioned in such a way as to create a central cross axial aisle from the west entrance of the tower to the apse and across from the north and south, uh, across from the north to the south entrances, or entrance. <clears throat> 
After analyzing the dimensions and architectural features of St. Paul's, it becomes keenly apparent that the church does not conform to the ecclesiastical building traditions of colonial Virginia's Anglican churches. As the British Empire's oldest Anglican colony in North America, Virginia possessed an architectural tradition replete with English precedent and local tradition. Anglican churches in colonial Virginia adhere to what some scholars have called the traditional Anglican plan, which had its roots in Anglican architectural developments occurring in England from the late Middle Ages to the Restoration in 1660. Chief among these developments were the high church reforms instituted by Carolyn divines like Archbishop William Laud. Throughout this period, English churches were partitioned into two distinct spaces, a nave and a chancel. These spaces corresponded to their distinct liturgical use within the primary worship service of the Book of Common Prayer. Excuse me. <clears throat> the nave, or the main body of the church, was primarily used for the reading of the main service and the preaching of the sermon, while the chancel contained the altar and represented the exclusive setting for the celebration of the Holy Eucharist, or Lord's Supper. High church innovations in the 1630s saw this division enhanced by the introduction of a balustrade around the altar and wooden screens, which divided the main body of the church from the chancel and the altar within. This was done to protect the altar and chancel from profane use and thus elevate the sense of the sacredness of the sacrament. English churches built using the traditional plan were marked by long, narrow dimensions. Their interior arrangements were characterized by a central east-west aisle, which divided the seating in the nave. Seating usually faced east toward the reading desk and pulpit, which were positioned roughly adjacent to the chancel screen located at the east end of the nave. The conservative nature of the traditional plan with its elevation of Eucharistic devotion made it exceptionally appealing to the traditional liturgical mores of Anglican parishes in colonial Virginia. From at least the 1660s onward, Virginia vestries erected churches characterized by elongated dimensions and marked by a central east-west aisle. Pulpits were often positioned just forward of the chancel screen, which were placed between 10 and 15 feet from the front of the altar at the church's east end. South and west entrances, single-story sidewall elevation, and sizable east windows were also defining features. While Virginia Anglican churches did not exhibit the same degree of architectural partitioning between the main body of the church and the chancel as many of their English contemporaries, the internal ordering of the chancel screen and the southeast end at the southeast end of the south wall conformed to the traditional layout. A superlative example of this arrangement can be seen in the Newport Parish Church, or St. Luke's, built in 1682 in Isle of Wight County, Virginia. Following the traditional plan, the church possesses an axial center, center aisle, a chancel screen dividing the, divided, <coughs> excuse me, dividing the nave from the altar, and a, a chancel door on the south wall at the east end. The 18th century saw a number of alterations to the Virginia church design, such as the relocation of the main entrance to the west facade and the removal of chancel screens. However, in all significant aspects, the internal layout and dimensions of the Virginia Parish churches in the late 17th to early 18th centuries were comparable to English, traditional English forms. By the 1660s, the traditional plan had established itself as the standard of Anglican church design in Virginia and will remain essentially unchanged for the next century. This traditional longitudinal plan meant that Virginia, Angl Virginia parish churches were characteristically rectangular in shape and thus were twice as long as they were wide. This ratio remained the architectural norm uh, for Virginia Anglican churches from the late 17th century to the eve of the revolution. Newport Parish Church measures 28 by 64 feet and the presently ruinous lower church of Southwark Parish in Surrey County, built in 1752, adheres to the same plan, spanning 34 by 74, 34 feet wide and 74 feet long. Anglican churches in colonial Maryland, however, did not follow the traditional plan. American, Maryland Anglican churches fundamentally adhered to an auditory or room church plan, which developed in the early 17th century, but was raised to prominence by Christopher Wren and his designs for London parish churches following the fire of 1666. 
The auditory form represented a singular, single rectangular room which largely lacked any visual or spatial partition between the nave and the chancel. The plan possesses no chancel screen to demarcate the chancel from the nave and is characterized by broad dimensions. The plan was designed to accentuate the spoken elements of the service and maximize parishioners' hearing and seeing of the preacher. The design emphasized that all who attended should be able to hear the word clearly and without distinction, a sentiment Wren deeply maintained. Accordingly, pulpits and auditory churches were prominently positioned in a central location. <coughs> Wren's auditory church churches were far squarer than their rectangular longitudinal predecessors of the late Middle Ages and Reformation, only two-thirds the length and thus possessing a 1 to 1.5 width to length ratio. Maryland Anglican churches would adopt two variations of Wren's auditory plan as the standard forms of their churches. The most typical form was characterized by a central doorway along the one, on one, one of the side elevations and a second entrance placed squarely in the center of the west gable end. The altar was placed directly opposite the west entrance along the east wall. A central aisle ran... Oh, dear. Okay, <laughs> whatever. <clears throat> uh, the, the, excuse me. The altar was placed directly, op, op, directly opposed the west entrance along the east wall. A central aisle ran from a, a low ba a central aisle ran from a low balustrade surrounding the communion table to the west doorway. A cross aisle ran northward from the central doorway in a side elevation and intersected the east-west aisle. The cross aisle would then usually terminate by a large tiered pulpit positioned against the north wall. The second plan was distinguished by possessing three entrances <coughs> with the uh, with a, excuse me uh, with the main gable with the main entrances uh, centrally located along the north south walls and a third at the west gable end. The pulpits were usually positioned closer to the east end of the church along the north and south wall. The ceiling was divided into three sections: a central arch and two shorter spans on either side between the outer walls and the columns which held a flat ceiling. The east-west aisle extended from the west door to the chancel and bisected a cross aisle which ran from the north and south entrances and the central portions of the long walls. A small but notable number of these churches possessed articulated apses. Some of these apses were rectangular, but the majority were semicircular in shape. Churches with this form were largely con concentrated among principal parish churches located in St. Mary's County and Queen Anne's County. Uh, this design is clearly, uh, clearly has its origins in Wren's plan for St. James Piccadilly in London, which was built between 1676 and 1684. St. James Piccadilly possessed a north and south and west entrance and was internally arranged as a singular open room based on a cross axial floor plan. The barrel vaulted ceiling rested on a series of pyramids, pillars which supported the side and back galleries. Through examining the plans of, of churches such as St. James Piccadilly, the relationship between St. Paul's Edenton and Anglican churches in Maryland becomes apparent. St. James Piccadilly served as the principal conceptual template from which the vestrymen of Maryland and St. Paul's adapted the design for their parish churches. Uh, they follow the same auditory church plan promulgated by Wren of possessing a 1 to 1.5 width to length ratio. They are laid out as a single room with three entrances, one in the west gable and the remaining two in the respectively, re the remaining two respectively occupying the central portions of the north and south elevations. And seating is divided by a cross axial aisle running east to west from the chancel uh, to the west gable doorway and north to south from the central ward along the walls. And once again, columns support a barrel arch ceiling and a pending side and rear galleries. Uh, the original plan and proportions of churches like St. Church, uh, like uh, Christ Church Chaptico and St. Mary's County, Maryland are virtually identical to those of St. Paul's. Most notably, their naves share the same dimensional measurements of 60 feet long and 40 feet wide. In addition to Christ Church Chaptico and, and St. Luke's, uh, in addition to Christ Church Chaptico and St. Luke's of Churchill, Queen Anne Mary's, Queen Anne's County, Maryland, 
Uh, they both share with St. Paul's a five bay by three bay nave <clears throat> plan, excuse, excuse me, marked by central, uh, by central north and south entrance and the side elevations. They also possess semicircular articulated apses. The appeal of this plan to Maryland and Edenton vestrymen would, was, in its, was in that it was a modern, broadly familiar, was that it was modern, broadly familiar, and identifiable with the best church designs coming out of London. The availability and popularity of architectural books meant that such plans would have been widely known by colonial churchmen and artisans. The history of Anglican establishment in colonial Maryland and North Carolina also had a significant role in shaping St. Paul's architecture. The religious history of the colonial Maryland and North Carolina were marked by the relatively late arrival of Anglican, uh, Anglicanism as a considerable force upon the local religious landscape. Non-Anglican religious groups such as dissenters and Catholics possess considerable political and social and cultural influence in the early histories of each colony. Uh, the diversity of religious groups also meant that Maryland and North Carolina experienced periods of legislated religious toleration. Fervent political machinations and maneuverings also took place between these disparate religious groups and characterized the events leading up to the official establishment of, Angli of the Anglican Church in Maryland and North Carolina. In some cases, Anglican establishment was a particularly hard-won battle. After establishment, there was a distinct need by both colonies to declare the official, the official patronage and social presence of the Anglican Church on the local landscape through the construction of new churches. There was a need to announce the Church of England's prominence in, co in the colonial society in Maryland and North Carolina through building decidedly modern Anglican edifices. The auditory plan of Wren's City Churches represented a distinctly Anglican form of church architecture, which reflected the renewed, robust Anglicanism of the Restoration and Georgian eras. Thus, parish officials in colonial Maryland and North Carolina may have felt the need to build churches which quite literally proclaimed the veracity of the Anglican way to a society where the establishment of the church in England was occasionally revealed to be tenuously grounded. The influence of Anglican missionary societies, such as the, propagate, the Society of the Propagation of the Gospel in foreign parts, which, uh, which played a key role in the promotion of Anglican ministry and missions in Maryland and North Carolina, may have also had a significant influence in the choice of an auditory plan. The youth of these colonies also meant that they were often susceptible to the novelty and popularity of metropolitan church designs. Lacking the presence of an older architectural tradition as, as Virginia possessed, Maryland and North Carolina vestries felt free to adapt the new and fashionable designs of urban churches of Restoration and Georgian London to the circumstances of their local parishes. The circumstances around St. Paul's Parish in Edenton were that of a bustling coastal town and colonial capital. Officially incorporated in 1722, Edenton represented one of the three major seaports along the east, along the North Carolina coast. Edenton was located in the northwest corner of the Albemarle Sound on a bay just east of the mouth of the Chowan River. During the 1730s, Edenton possessed as many as 60 houses, making it the largest town in North Carolina, according to some sources. And by 1776, that number would, have, would more than double to 177. And from the 1730s to the eve of the revolution, Edenton was a major trading port. Its, its principal exports were staves, shingles, tobacco, and corn. Edenton was also the county seat of Chowan, and thus represented a major administrative center for the Albemarle region. Its courthouse was considered to be one of the most imposing buildings in the southern colonies. And often, the, and often the colonial assembly met in Edenton during its legislative session, sessions. The Eden, Edenton's political and economic prominence meant that some of the leading figures in the colony were, per, were parishioners at St. James. Figures such as Samuel Johnston, Joseph Hughes, and Thomas and Penelope Parker regularly attended the church. The wealth and social status of such parishioners, many of whom would appear on the vestry, meant that they would have considerable influence upon the architectural choices made, by, made, when, made when constructing St. Paul's. Uh, the choice of a novel, fashionable church form would symbolically portray the piety and prestige of Edenton's Anglican elite. It would also act as a physical indicator of the wealth and prominence of Edenton as a major political and trading center. 
Adapting a metropolitan design would demonstrate that Anglican side in, Eden in Edenton was up on the latest London building traditions and that Edenton would have a church worthy of its status as a colonial capital. After considering the provenance, historical background, and social setting of, of St. Paul's, one can finally begin the process of exegeting its architecture in order to draw out the spatial theology of Edenton's Anglican community. Anglican piety was marked by a keen sense of sacred space and a sensate experience of the holy during the Georgian era. The spatial theology and sensate piety was often expressed in the various architectural features of Georgian Anglican churches. Churches were conceived of as places which were especially sacred because the presence of God was considered more substantive there. St. Paul's possesses at least five architect Anglican architectural features which can provide us with insights into the church's spatial theology. First, its auditory plan demonstrates the Anglican reverence for the power of the spoken word, especially when read during the divine service. Words, were especially, words especially biblical or liturg liturgical words, were full of sacred power and sacred presence. Secondly, its arched windows indicated that St. Paul's was a sacred space consecrated specifically for worship. Thirdly, the arched ceiling represented the heavens and signified the presence of God within the church. Fourthly, the arched tympana of Margaret Davidson's mid 18th century grave symbolized the passage of the deceased soul to be with God and the hope of future, excuse me, future resurrection. Fifthly, the semicircular apse accentuates the importance and sanctity of the celebration of the Eucharist in a setting which placed considerable emphasis on the hearing of the word. All these things considered together demonstrate that St. Paul's architecture is largely based on a traditional Anglican spatial theology that typified Anglican piety in the first half of the 18th century. This spatial theology recognized that while God was omnipresent, he was simultaneously more present in the space of the church, especially when it worshiped. Enlightenment Anglicanism, with its devotion to rationalism and the aesthetics of holiness, had not made its influence felt upon the architecture of St. Paul's. St. Paul's Episcopal Church fundamentally represents a colonial adaptation of Red Restoration architect Christopher Wren's auditory plan, which he developed after the London Fire of 1666. The plan finds its great, greatest expression among Anglican churches of colonial Maryland. St. Paul's relationship to Maryland Anglican churches is rooted in the popularity of auditory church plans among colonies which only had experienced Anglican establishment for a short time. And St. Paul's use of an auditory plan is also keenly related to its appeal as a fashionable church form to elite parishioners of Edenton. These factors help us to understand how the Anglicans of colonial Eden, Edenton understood the power and presence of, of the sacred in their daily lives and as they worshiped together, as well as the ways they expressed this sense in the architecture of St. Paul's. Thank you.